Good morning and welcome to today's episode of Women Empowerment Program, being organized and sponsored by the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria P1. My name is Nkem Okereke, your host for this program with my co-host Ijoma Igwe. For today, we shall be discussing women's leadership and political participation, policies and laws. This is important at this time, especially as we are all counting down to the 2023 elections. There has also been talks on a bill to create additional special seats for women in the National Assembly and state houses of assembly. This is in addition to the national gender policy we currently have in Nigeria that see to the increased participation of women in governance. In today's episode, we hope to speak in depth on these policies, what they aim to achieve and the implementation. We shall go on a short break and then come back with our guests for this topic. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to the show. Our guest for today is one of the mentors from previous leadership and mentorship program organized by P1. She is currently the head women affairs and gender cluster committee, African Union, Ecosoft, Nigeria. She's also the technical advisor, deputy chief with Federal House of Representatives and the founder of We We Network Afri, a pan-African organization Please welcome with us this morning, Ms. Adora Oyinche. Good morning, Maya. Welcome. Thank to you the very show. much for having me on your show again. Welcome to the show now. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So you know what we are discussing today, <laughs> and you know, it's I'm sure it's a very interactive topic, right? So we want to find out from you. We have lots of policies, or not not lots, but some policies that help to increase women's participation in politics. We have the UN NCR 1325 and the National Gender Policy. Okay. So can you say these policies are effectively implemented? And if not, what do you think can be done to help for the effective implementation of the policy? Okay, thank you so much for that question. And thank you again for having me on the show. Well done to all that you do. Um, I think, first of all, I would like to you know, take it back a notch. You know, let's go back to um, history line, starting from the conversation at the Beijing conference, um, you know, the Maputo Protocol, all of these policies, you know, that talks about increasing women's participation either in the social uh, development space or the political space or the policy space um, have always been there. Uh, but the question is, how have we pushed past, you know, having these policies, justice policies, and then move to implementation. And you do know that when you look at the status quo of Nigeria, amongst other leading African countries, we have perhaps one of the highest populations, especially when we look at our women's population. Um, and half that population also are uh, one, the voting you know, population, mm -hmm. and also have the ability to have them voted for. But the question is how much of the women are involved uh, in the process? Mm -hmm. And each time we have this conversation, we go back to the drawing table to say, where are we going wrong? And what have we done so far? And we keep the comparisons of by, you know, using countries like Rwanda, Senegal, uh, South Africa, Namibia. But then you look at the dynamics for different countries. And I'll bring it back home. Um, what are our challenges? Remember, Nigeria is a very patriarchal country. Um, the society, the environment is very, you know, uh, masculine. And whether we like it or not, our development is hinge is, 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 has a harbinger on our culture, on our tradition, on our religion. 
So these are all stems. These are all roots that are socially intertwined. And we need to also look at reviewing methods of implementation and look at how they have accommodated those areas of conversation because those are where the stereotypes begin to, you know, sort of cloud and veil intervention. So I think that the policies have been there. I mean, the gender uh, policy bill, you also have, you know, some of the new policies that are coming under bills mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, the gender opportunities equal bill as well, which was also sponsored by Senator Lujimi. You're also looking at the bill HB 1301 sponsored by Nkiri Konyadocha, which we refer to as a women's bill, where we're looking for extra seats mm -hmm. uh, for women at the National Assembly, you know, House of Reps, Senate, and the State Assembly. And these bills are coming up because of lack of implementation of already existing policies. Mm -hmm. We have seen that without legislation, these policies will only sit in the dressing table. Mm -hmm. And remember that when the bills are passed, it means that there is a veto of confidence on it. It means that the presidency and the executive are going to be held accountable for lack of implementation. Legislators are only facilitators of bills. Mm -hmm. It is not up to them to implement. Mm -hmm. It is up to the civil society, it's up to the executive, it's also up to us within the civil society and the development sectors to push for implementation. But when we have a legislation on it, okay. what that means is that it is binding. And so there will be punitive measures to be able to be, you know, considered for those who are defaulters of it. So it is not the lack of policy. It's also the lack of political will for implementation. And that's what we need to start drawing back the conversation. So I'm, I'm going to ask you now, you know, we you talked earlier about Nigeria being patriarchal and we talked about uh, national gender policy. So if we have national gender policy, it means it's already bill that is passed. It has a policy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it is not being uh, implemented mm -hmm. because Nigeria is patriarchal in nature. Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking about the 35% affirmative yeah. action. Yeah. How do you think it can improve? Since Nigeria is not implementing national gender policy, how is Nigeria going to implement 35% affirmative action on women inclusion in politics and leadership roles? Now remember that a lot of these are um, what we call temporary measures, TMs, mm -hmm. for a period of time. Now, for countries who have, you know, um, struggled with gender mainstreaming and looking at equal participation of women, especially in policy making, mm -hmm. governance and decision making, they have looked at, you know, the status quo of women and looked at, you know, creating extra spaces for women for a period of time, e.g., the extra women sit is supposed to last for 16 years, which is, you know, a period of time, you know, in, in the nation's, you know, um, policy making environment. What that means is that within that 16 years period, within that number of years, we're going to have more women in office. We're going to have more women at the assembly, the, the state assembly, the house of rep. Remember, lawmaking is about numbers. And when we do not have enough numbers to support the bills that women are making in the assembly or encourage each other, we stand the risk of also still going back to private lobbying, which takes a longer time and which takes critical measures for us to be able to implement. So I believe that, one, if you're looking at the 35% affirmative action and the environment, we are going to be in a patriarchal system for a period of time. But that does not mean we cannot look at alternative measures to shove up implementation, you know, methods. Mm -hmm. For instance, we started the conversation about having the men in the conversation, mm -hmm. the he for she's, and having those conversations post pushed by certain numbers of persons at the assembly. The women's bill, for instance, is co-sponsored by the speaker, Femi Bajabi Amila, and 85 other members. And that means that we already have a consensus. It's past second reading. Mm -hmm. So what we are waiting for now is how will the Senate look at it? Mm -hmm. The Senate has looked at it and there is a conversation back door to say, Let's Let's reintroduce it from a different conversation. We have the Gender Equal Opportunities Bill, which is looking at a 35% affirmative action in a way similar. But what we are saying is that when the law is binding, when there is a legislation, enabling, enabling that conversation becomes, you know, um, it becomes instructive. So you're no longer only saying, you know, we are lobbying for 35% affirmative action because it's a policy guide. Yeah. A policy guide is only as implemented as it has a law binding. So you have, okay, for instance, you have 
most men as ministers and you have most men in the hierarchy of the conversation of power when there is a need to um you know nominate or reference you know more persons they will nominate more men yeah. but if you have more women in the spaces you are conscious of the fact that more women will be able to increase participation of women by also giving room to reference in other women so mm -hmm. that's what we're saying if we have an extra 111 members you know at the house of parliament I think in total is 469 you will see increment if you look at the statistics of the state assembly bronu zero no woman jigawa zero no woman Quara, zero, no woman. Abia, no woman. The list is endless, you know. And then you're counting the Kano, Taraba, you know. The list is endless. There are no women. The highest number of participation at the state assembly level is at the Enugu State Assembly with 17%. In total, we have only 4.5% in aggregate for state assembly members that are women. So imagine if we have extra numbers for that period of years, for those period of years. By the time we come to review, we would already have more women, you know, in those conversations at the state assembly already there and then you will now be able to say have we done enough and do we have to review the the, the you know the conversation on more women next receipts or can we take it from where we are by then we would have had more women already and that status quo is what we are looking at and like i always say you're only as good as your better population and i know the men will argue with me but i always feel that the female population not a better population because we, we multi-tax um we we are accessible we we nurture we are open-minded and we are very financially prudent so i believe that if we are able to increase more women, one in lawmaking, if you if you raise a bill on domestic, uh, you know, violence against women, you will have more women also looking at it as a necessity and not as an alternative, yeah. which usually happens. So thank you very much. I think you have gone. Ijem, I know you have something to ask, but I just want to put in this before I forget. Mm -hmm. So I know you have stylishly told us why we need to make sure that this is passed. Mm -hmm. But then again, you talked about the gender equity bill yes. and you said it's almost similar to the 35% affirmative action. Yeah. So I want to know the status of this 35% affirmative action mm -hmm. and that of the gender equity bill. Now, the gender equality bill, which is great creation of more women in uh, uh, seats in the has House it, of, it's it it past second reading, okay. but we are still going to have to go to, you know, um, there's going to be dialogue, there's going to be um, open debate, there's going to be conversations at the committee level. It will still have to go to the Senate and then also have to go to the president for assent. Now, we already know that it's a periodic period where elections are coming to the fore. 2023 okay. is in the norm. Mm -hmm. um, people are going to be asking questions like you know where are the women mm -hmm. how are voices going to count and some people are already raising the conversation that no woman no vote and so if you're already beginning that conversation the best thing to do to review participation and give women a leading role is to actually have laws that will help the increment the 35 percent affirmative action looks at a lot of conversation between within that bill the gender equal gender equal opportunities bill looks at you know um domestic violence against women looks at sexual harassment looks at women in appointive position looks at the several line lines in between but the extra seat bill is extra seats at the house of representative at the senate and at the state assembly meaning that if we have the gender equal opportunities bill and we have more women you know at the assembly mm -hmm. when we have such bills it will be easier to pass mm -hmm. it will be easier to mobilize around it because then we have more women voices mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. so that's the engineering of such conversation we are not saying that you know it will not meet its challenges but that's why we're having these conversations yeah. so that people would also not think about it ignorantly from a place of oh just giving women more seats mm -hmm. what about the already existing seats what are they going to do with it remember what it means is that those women who are coming to contest are going to contest amongst women alone yeah. for those particular seats. It doesn't also mean that those already existing seats cannot be contested by women. So it is saying that the other seats are, you can contest with the men, but these other seats are reserved for women mm -hmm. so that we can shove up the number as we go. Okay, Idem, I'm sorry, but I have to ask again. <laughs> you are talking about special seats for women. Absolutely. So th this means that in the National Assembly or maybe in the State House of Assembly, apart from the seats that we already have, Absolutely. you have a, a, like a separate 35 reserved, yes. reserved yes. for women. Yes. So what I'm trying to say again is, what if maybe... 
uh, 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 things need to happen and the, the discussions need to take place and they feel that, oh, we don't need this 35. Let's even face you get the women are they now part of those ones because they are in their special seats mm. and they are, they are not invited mm. in the main discussion mm. no I, I think let, let me think let me let me let me explain point. that special seats is just a nomenclature that defines that these seats are for women contestable by women Those but seats. still within but still within the rankings not like creating no special no it's not it's not it's not special it does not ostracize them from the conversations with already existing legislators but what we are saying is that these seats are women's seats so that means that for instance in namibia you know um there was a time that they had a special you know conversation on only women counselors for a period of years mm -hmm. and so only women could contest for several positions so what that meant is that they already had men occupying most of those positions for that particular role mm -hmm. so with more women involved they now had equal opportunities mm -hmm. for women and so there were there were a level of you know um level playing ground for both the men and women but more women came on board because there were special seats for that particular counselorship you know position that's exactly what we're adopting we're saying that for the women special seats it's special because it is only for women the men are not going to contest with mm -hmm. the women mm -hmm. it's just the women but they are still part of the legislative you know process whether they came in through the extra seats or not a legislator is a legislator and i think that's the ideology behind it and i believe that what that means is that you will also find women filling in very critical committees remember that all the committees in the house you have agriculture you have education you have military you have security you find out that there's always the men that are always chairing and even deputizing. But when we have more women, you see that there will be also, uh, it, it will be intentional because what you see is that, you know, without thinking about the women begin to twin, you know, deputize, take chairmanship for several, you know, several roles. Apart from a few women who have chaired committees. I mean, the aviation uh, committee was chaired by Nkiruka, Honorable Nkiru Konya I think for eight years, two terms. But after that, who, who is now there? You know, what do, what we need to do is let's have more women. And to engage in those conversations. And I think that by the time we're done with the testing measures and come back to review, we would have had enough numbers to be able to say, yes, now we can have those conversations on 35% affirmative action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now. I'm very fine. <laughs> Thank you very much for that clarification. Yeah. So remember we, when we started, you talked about the Maputo protocol. Yes. So we're going to ask you the Maputo protocol scorecard and the index mm. have been developed to support effective you know, women participation. Absolutely. Women participation. Do you think it's something we can adopt in Nigeria? And do you think if we do, it will become effective? I think uh, it's already in work. Um, okay. uh, there have been cases that have been reviewed using the uh, Maputo Protocol, you know, index and also the review within the policies. Um, I know someone like uh, Dorothy and Jemanze also, you know, had a case with, you know, the federal government citing the Maputo Protocol and using some of the existentialities within those cases, okay. you know. And I think it is just for us to be policy literate. I think for us, mm -hmm. and I would say this instructively, one thing that we lack, you know, or that we need to work on and do better is policy literacy for women. Okay. Women should know what their rights are. Women should know where they can reference those rights. Mm -hmm. Women should know the institutions that are caught them availability to respond to them if their rights are trampled on. Women should be able to also understand the meaning of having those rights okay. in, and domiciled within the uh, different institutions that they are meant to govern. A lot of women have heard of the extra seats, mm -hmm. but they want to understand at the community level, that's where the population is. And I keep saying that our conversation is about community development because it is a bottom top approach yeah. and the population of women are more at the rural level. Yeah. So whatever we do, Policy literacy is very important, and it is most important that we take this conversation. Like this Maputo protocol you talked about, I can I can tell you that there that might be a little number or more of women who know about it at the community level and know how to use it. So policy literacy is very, very instructive for people, especially women, to mm -hmm. own their rights and be able to do what they can knowing their rights. Thank you very much. So we will be going on a short break now. Thank you, Miss Adora, for all you have done. And on this topic, you've been doing justice to that. So our viewers will be going on a short break and then we'll come back to continue this interesting conversation. Please stay tuned.
welcome back to the show. I'm sure you've been enjoying this program the way we are here. So, Ma, before we went on the break, you've given us a lot of, you know, how the policies would work and affect it. But you, as one of the mentors from P1's leadership and mentorship program, can you, do you think the, the program itself has helped uh, encourage young women to want to participate in governance? What's your view? Absolutely. Uh, for me, it was very exciting. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was very insightful. It, it, it was also an expose. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, prior to that, you know, I probably have done one-on-one -on -one mentee with just one or two persons. Okay. Um, but what I also experienced is that I had about four mentees under me. Yeah. I had Awitu. Mm -hmm. I had Sadatu, mm -hmm. I had Rahila, yeah. um, I had Bushra, Bushra yeah. and I had Fatima. Yeah. And, you well, know, we... Remember absolutely. <laughs> and so um, I think for me, getting to know the young women closely was something that was very defining. Yeah. Why? Because you would find out that, um, you know, you from, from a distance, you could, you could just, you know, have a, you know, a surface evaluation of what somebody wants to do yeah. or where they are headed or their yeah. goals. But interacting with them, I think the first thing we did was you know, self-development, you yeah. know, where, where, where's your projection from now to the next two years? Yeah. And, you know, we had several classes on what I can do. Yeah. Rahila did an advocacy, you know, um, project on speaking on women, yeah. especially as she's a barrister and, uh, you know, uh, focuses on gender-based violence and all yeah. of that. And it was instructive. You know, I put it out on, on Facebook and people were like, oh, wow, this is very instructive. Yeah. And over the time, they were able to be exposed to several um events yeah. the women in politics forum mm -hmm. uh they went for once or twice and they lapped them up i mean mm -hmm. rahila now i think is yeah, uh the, chair the chairperson yeah. you know so giving them platforms also exposed their leadership capacities and they are also becoming mentors themselves mm -hmm. as they are becoming exposed so i think that it also shows us what we lacked you know albinisha before now and i can imagine that if we had that mentorship, you know, mm -hmm. before now. And a lot of young women could have that mentorship before going into leadership positions or political positions. Um, it would have been, it would have been far better. Mm -hmm. You would have had experiential guidance mm -hmm. and you would also have made informed choices. Mm -hmm. But I think that what works best mm -hmm. is the fact that we were able to have that conversation on what next, okay. you know, beyond politics. What are you thinking beyond leadership? How do you use the space you're in? Because one of the things that um, I think, I think it was either Bushra or Rahila asked was, you know, how do you get to know your legislators better within your own environment? I said, well, it's when you speak truth to power. Yeah. Look at the issues within your community, within your constituency, and begin to have ideas with people around you mm -hmm. and ask for a courtesy call to either your representative or write a letter. Mm -hmm. And that's how the conversation begins. Mm -hmm. And people always think as though you have to know somebody to know somebody. But yeah. now the world is mobile on this social media space. Mm -hmm. And it is better for the person to listen to you in person yeah. than have those issues trampled upon and be called a failed leader. Mm -hmm. So I think it is very, very instructive that mentorship... Um, is transient because mm -hmm. one, I, I'm still being mentored by several mentors of mine. I think for the rest of our life, there is somebody we will look up to, we will listen to yeah. that will give us guiding steps. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not yet Uhuru. I feel that even when you become a governor, when you are a president, that's why you have a think tank. Yeah. That's why you have advisors. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are mentorship streams, you know. So I think it's something that we must encourage. However, I think what also did not work so well is timing. Mm -hmm. Um, one, because, um, I was, I'm a very busy person. They are also engaged in several things. So, uh, what we decided to cultivate and maximize was the social media space, the okay. virtual space. Okay. Remember, we were just coming, we we're just coming out of a COVID pandemic. Okay. And so the Zoom calls and the meetings afforded us the platforms to be able to engage. Okay. But sometimes, because my work is ad hoc sometimes. So we get into a meeting and I have to take over. I say, okay, you take over and then give me a brief. And so okay. it also taught them. Mm -hmm. to be able to be proactive yeah. okay yeah. and be in charge so um i i mean i learned from them as well because it also showed a sense of teamwork mm -hmm. um I understood that one balance was also very key. Yeah. These, these young women also have families. They also have things they are doing. So how do you balance, you know, their mental space and their social space? How much of them, how many of them are? I gave them a fitness, you know, questionnaire to know what their mental fitness was like. Yeah. So it also exposed me to backgrounding people's state of mind, you know, yeah. what they're thinking, what yeah. you're going through. And a lot of women didn't have that. And I would say that for myself because I ran in the 2019 
elections and post election we didn't have so much as a close you know space a safe space to converse to be able to discuss what went wrong mm -hmm. in the election and how we're dealing with our lives now yeah. so people just expect us to move on mm -hmm. you know nobody's knowing the backstory except when they call us for experience sharing but backstage there are things we can't share exactly. because those things are the things that taught us and we need that we need people who are also experienced in the closed space mm -hmm. but this is what the mentoring offers the girls and i think is very instructive yeah so thank you very much you yeah. said something that did not work with said about time yeah timing so what do you think if we want to do this in the future what do you think we can do about the timing what do you think can be done about it i think first of all um we need to know what the routine is like um what sort of careers you know because there's an everyday life and there's a need for self-development yeah. so what's your everyday life routine what, what 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 work do you do what's your career and remember that you cannot on this, um, substitute that because it's also part of their self-development it pays yeah. the bills yeah. and it also puts them in the space that yeah. where they are also seen so my 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 suggestion could be that we have some sort of conversation on time timelines yeah. so for instance we want to do a mentorship program when are you people available? What days would work for okay. everyone? Okay. So if it's a once a week or once a month or once a year, we know that whatever we do, we prioritize yeah. and put that space as a priority space. And so we give it our best. And then at the end of every quarter, we can have some sort of retreat okay. and, you know, have a getaway with the girls or maybe have a day we spend having lunch and just having an informal space yeah. because it's also good to see them outside their formal space yeah. so that you can get what the other side of them also tells you about character, yeah. habits, values, principles and those are also part of mentorship yeah. thank you thank very much. you very much okay. from what she said you can see you, you also enjoyed the mentorship oh absolutely I, I see them all over the space now we're yeah. speaking on panels and I i'm know. like yes <laughs> we had rahila on the show yeah, she sure. couldn't just stop mentioning your name oh my wonderful mentor oh my wonderful I'm like, okay yes, and from you now we can mm. see that it's, it's a mutual thing oh yes that oh was yes a real, um, oh, experience yes. they had so my um, P1 is also, we are planning to organize a virtual leadership and mentorship program okay. soon. Okay. And what would, what would you be your advice to young women that would want to apply from your experience as a mentor? What would you want to advise them? Be deliberate about what you want. Okay. Um, and have an open mind to on learning certain things. Yeah. Um, one of the things that challenges young women uh, who want to grow in leadership is you come with a mindset, mm -hmm. you come with an, an assumed, you know, um, stereotype of what you're expecting. Yeah. But then you come into a space with different people, diverse, you know, knowledge, and you want to be able to say to yourself, I am able to unlearn certain things because mm -hmm. those things are limiting. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they are not correct, but they are not good for me where I am at. So I think that they should come being deliberate to learn and okay. to unlearn and relearn certain things. But most importantly, maximize your network, get in touch with people. And remember that post your mentorship program, these people become part of your relationships yeah. for the rest of your life. Yeah. Savor them, you know, nurture them and make sure that it doesn't stop at mentorship. And for instance, you know, I know everybody's birthdays. I know what they're going to be doing in the next couple of, you know, years and months. And so I'm chipping in. I'm saying, where are you people? Are you okay? Oh, I'm having this event. Can you people come in? Oh, I'm speaking here. I want you to speak. I want you to be on the panel. Oh, I'm having a party. Yeah. Oh, uh, so yeah, you nice. need to, you need to keep the relationship going because how you're able to know the output of what processes you guys engaged in mm. is to see who they become over the years yeah. and how it shapes your life as a mentor. Mm. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we have uh, almost come to the end of the program. <laughs> but then I will want to put a summary to what we have done so far. And this is women's political and leadership participation, policies and laws, trying to talk about women's inclusion in policy making, in political spaces, and what P1 has been doing so far to ensure that young women participate in political processes. Ijoma, do you have other things to add? Yeah, I don't have said a whole lot of things <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to pick up. But then I like the fact that you talked about political education. Yes. So people people being aware of their rights and yeah. what they should do, actually. And I like the bonding part between you and the, your mentees it's, it really shows there's growth yeah. and more of mentorship programs more experience sharing probably would also help more young people to 
help them become more deliberate and True. define what they want to be. True. So, so thank you very much, Ijoma, for that. And thank you again, Miss Adora. <laughs> so right now, P1, the registration for women's uh, virtual training on uh, leadership and mentorship program is also ongoing. And uh, please, you are all advised. Remember, we're talking about women's inclusion in political processes. So you are advised to register and participate in this upcoming program. We'll see you again next week, Friday, 11 a.m. as we discuss another interesting topic still on women empowerment. For now, I will say have a wonderful weekend.